My name's Chris. I have the opportunity to serve as pastor here, one of the pastors, and um, and I just I'm so excited about what we're doing. We are actually going through the book of Ephesians. It's actually a letter. We started last. Last week, you missed the setup, but we're dealing with a bunch of jacked up people um, in the church of Ephesus, right? And, and I know I'm dealing with a bunch of jacked up people at Vision, right? Because I'm jacked up, and, and, and we're all a little messed up in some ways, right? And, and so if you can't admit that, you got some problems, and, and welcome to the, to the church. We do too. So Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, we got some flawed people. That, they're flawed in their faith. We got some fake people that, are, that don't really have faith, and then we got some freed people that have a free in faith. And so we're going to open up chapter one today and we are going to dig. Now, I'm going I'm to make a caveat. I'm going I'm to say something that's really important. You need to listen. Um, if you need to go ahead and um, go to the bathroom, I'd love for you to do it now because what I'm going to preach on is a very deep passage. I'm talking deep. I'm going to be real with you. I don't like it when people say, I want to go deep. If you want to go deep, go deep. Nothing's stopping you from going deep. You don't need a spoon to go deep. You, you need to go ahead and dig on your own, right? Like you don't need a pastor to preach a, a deeper sermon for you to go deep. Like just go deep. Like don't tell me you want to go deep. Just go deep. Go ahead. Dig on your own. Study on your own. Get in a group. Serve more. I mean, do, do the deep things, okay? But this message today, y'all, there's going to be a lot of questions during this message. A lot, okay? There's going to be a lot of maybe uncertainty, and you're going to want to push back on some things I say, and I love that because we sharpen one another. So if something don't sit right with you, that's good. Chew on it. Chew on it. Study it. Ask me questions. And so I want to tell you this because this is important. On the Vision app right now, we created a new button called ATM after the message. Get it? ATM? Like you thought you were going... No, ATM after the message, and here's what, it, here's what we're going to do. We're going to try this out. During this message and then after, if you get a question, if, if you're like, that, that don't sound right, I want to push on you, or I really have a question about this or what you said or this verse, submit it on there, and, 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 you, and your name and, and email come up, but you're, I won't get that stuff out to anyone. I'm the only one that's seeing that, and so you can submit your name and your email and stuff. But I'm the only one that's seeing that. But here's what I'm going to do with those questions. I'm going to study and, and prepare and make sure I have the answers come like Wednesday or Thursday. And I'm going to put out a video and our church can kind of after the message. And so your questions can be answered. Does that make sense? It sound good for everybody? All right. A couple people are excited. You, you guys are the question makers. Okay. Today is, is very, very deep. And it's such a... A theological, the way you think about God is such an important and rich passage. But there's going to be some things that are confusing, maybe, at first, that don't make sense. And some things that maybe we don't have the answers to. You, you ever have questions about God and you just, no one has the answer? You know why that is? R write this down. Deuteronomy 29, 29. This is why. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. What that's saying is we don't have the answers to everything. I don't like it when people say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to know everything. No, then that would make you God. There's no way. You're not going to be God when you get to heaven. And so there are some secret things, mysteries, things that are kept a secret. But what this verse is saying is we, we also know truth. We also know a lot of truth from the word. And we're not to disobey, dishonor that truth because of some mysteries we don't know. Just, don't, I get so frustrated because people don't understand God like they're supposed to. But they don't understand God and so they disobey God. That makes no sense. It, 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 it makes no sense. So be okay with that. Just dig into this message. Stay with me. Take notes. It's one of these sermons that you really need to, to know. And if you don't bring a pen or paper, open up your phone right now. we got sermon notes there ready to go for you. Here we go. Verse 3, we're going to start out. Actually, verse 3 to like 11 is one sentence. I thought about trying to read this in one breath. 
Um, but look at it. It's 202 words, I think. And it's one sentence in the Greek. In the original, it's actually one sentence. So it's a run on. So my wife used to te teach English and she would hate that sentence, right? And, and so, but here it is, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. This is pretty amazing. It's an amazing promise to the Ephesians. If you remember, I talked about it last week. The, the city of Ephesus was a, they were obsessed with the spirit world. The spirit world. And I know what you think when you think spirits. You think like these ghosts that are flying around and it's just weird. And maybe some of you are like, no, they don't exist. But, but the spirit world is very real. But they were obsessed with the spirit world. In fact, here's what they believe. If life is going well, then you're doing everything right to please the spirits. But if life is going poorly, you lost your job, your marriage is on the rocks, your kids are disobedient, you're struggling with depression, or, you know, if, if that's happening, then you've ticked off the spirits. And the spirits are getting you. Does that make sense, what they're, what they're believing? You know what this is called today, don't you? Karma. <laughs> karma. Some of you believe in karma. And karma, let me tell you something. Karma will enslave you. Karma will hold you in bondage. It's the reason why you think God is repaying you or paying you back. Because you can't get past what you did or what's been done to you. You can't get through this. And so you worry if God is just punishing you. If God is just disappointed in you. And you think everything you've done now is the reason why God is doing this and doing this. And that's why Uncle Henry died. And, and that's why I'm struggling. Because God, because God not proud of me. And God's not pleased with me. And that's bondage. I know there's some Christians in here that are struggling with that. You feel like a huge disappointment to God. Listen to me. If that's you, you need to zone in in this message. This message is for you. This verse right here, verse 3. Put that back on the screens for me. Paul makes the point. He says, God is for you. Because of Christ and you, you've been blessed. Here's how. Verse 4. Check this out. Even as he, underlined this word, chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Don't miss this. There has never, ever been a time, ever been a time where God did not know you. And there has never been a time where God has not loved you. Just listen to that. That's that verse. God, listen, listen to this. God cannot love you more than he does right now. Well, Chris, you don't know what I did last night. God does. God does. Before the, look, look, before the world was created. Think about this. God saw you knew you, and the Bible says he chose you. I told you to underline that word. God chose you. It's not just that simply God knew you would choose him. Think about this. This verse means that God set his love on you. And he chose you. Yeah, you. Jacked up, ragged old you. Messed up, addicted, you. Sinful, foul-mouthed, you. God chose you. So here's the question you're asking. Why? What, Chris, what in the world? What is it about me? Like, did he see all the... Did he see I was going to be a pastor? And that's why he chose me? 
Did he, did he see? Did he see that I would have a beautiful daughter that would go on and do miraculous things when she gets older and she's going to change a lot of people's lives through the power of Jesus and she's going to, is that why she chose me? Is that why God chose me? Did he, he saw my abilities, that I have the ability to think a certain way and do a certain thing and I, he, he saw me and I was good enough and that's why he chose me? Why did God choose you? If you're a follower of Jesus, why did God choose you? It's the same reason he chose the nation of Israel. Remember God's chosen people? You ever wonder, why, what is it about me? Here it is. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But why did he choose me? Verse 8. It is because the Lord loves you. God didn't choose you because you're beautiful. God didn't choose you because he knew you'd be sitting in church. God didn't choose you because you had some gifts that he needed. God didn't choose you because he knew you would make an impact on this earth. The reason God chose you. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You were broken. You were lost. You were dead. The only reason God chose you was through, it was grace. And it was his love. Well, I mean, I, I just remember, when I think about choosing, I remember elementary days, we played kickball, and like, we didn't choose certain people to be on the team. How many of you guys were the ones that weren't picked on the team? Yeah, we got, we got some of those, all right. Mainly on this side, they're flocking together. I don't understand, right? I get it, all right. Man, when, when I choose a team, I want the best. I want the best kickers. I want the best fielders. I want the best runners. I want the smartest people. And then I want all of you guys last, you know, right? I mean, like, but that's what we do, right? Listen to me. That's not the way God works. Well, Chris, if God chose me, then I don't have a choice. What, what about free will? Like, did God force me to love him? You guys ever wonder this stuff? Like, we're going deep today. Did God force me to love him? No. Romans 9. His choice is never against our will. The scripture says that all those who come to God freely choose. Well, then why does it say that God chose us first before the foundations of the world? Jesus said it best in John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now that word for draw, you look at that. It, it, it's the idea of this um, irresistible force. It, it's like uh, when you're hungry, when you're, when you're desperately hungry, you're drawn to what? For Jesus. To know Jesus. And that hunger, just that, you know, the Bible says that God has placed eternity in everyone's heart. So that hunger is drawing you to him. See, people, people choose to reject God. And because of that, the Bible says we're dead in our sin and we deserve judgment. We deserve wrath. We deserve separation. We, we deserve punishment. Because we, look, the human race has rejected God. Don't, don't sit there and think you haven't. We all reject God. God knew this. Our, our problem is not that we can't choose God. Our problem is we don't want to, right? We don't want to choose God because we're dead in our sin. We're dead. What does dead things do? They stay dead. Before Christ, you are dead.
We desire sin. So God, he begins to draw us, create this hunger. He, he starts working and drawing us that we begin to want him. Why does he do this? Because of his love and his grace. And look at this next verse in verse 5. He says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of Go ahead and say that. I am chosen by God. You're chosen by God. And I know you can't get that you can't get past who you are and your insecurities and your failures and your faults and what you don't have and what you can't do, but you just how you are are chosen by God, the creator. He sees you. He knows you right now. He's, he knows your mind. He knows your heart. He sees your struggles. He knows you because he chose you. And that's a beautiful thought. Some of you cannot live this life, the Christian life, the way you're supposed to because you can't even remember that you have been chosen by the one who created you. you got to walk in that every single day. That verse says he adopted you. That verse says, he adopted you. Now, I've never adopted, but we have families in here who have adopted. And I, I believe, you know what I think? I believe many of us know God as master. I believe many of us can see God as God. I believe many of us can see God as a judge. I, I, I believe many of us can see God like in the Bible. But I think very few of us sees God as our father. Some of us have major daddy issues. We had them on earth, and so it's been hard to have them with our Heavenly Father. Because we don't even know what a dad looks like. Look, God just said this. He chose you, and He adopted you. Which means He wanted you. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, He wants you. He wants to be your Abba. Your father, your dad. You, and if you've got a great relationship with your dad, you know what that's like. And that's what God desires from his children. You think adoption, we think kids. Back when this was written, adoption was for adults. Did you know this? A little history lesson. Um, Roman emperors, kings, they were all adopted. They were chosen by the current emperor. And in fact, you can go back and look. There were only three emperors that were blood related to the previous emperor. The rest were chosen, selected, adopted. Now, how would they choose the emperors? Well, they would look for the intellectual and the warriors and the ones who had clout and charisma, and the ones who who had it all together and, and were wealthy. And so they would pick these people, they would adopt these people to be the next emperor. So they would say, they would look at you, Brian, and they would go, yeah, you, you, might, you might work, Judy, you, you might work, Dave, no way, no way, Dave's out. And, and so, like, but, but they would adopt them based on what they, what value they could bring. Can I tell you something? God did not adopt you that way. He looked at you right now. He looks at you right now. He looked at you past and he saw your present. And he said, I want Miss Wanda. I choose you. And I know you're, you're going to struggle. And I know you're going to sin. Oh, and I hate sin, but I love you. I choose you. I'm adopting you. And I want to be your father today. You're in the family. If you've been chosen by God, if you, if you, if you follow Jesus, you are in the family. Which means, look around, you got a lot of brothers and sisters. 
And here's what good family members do. They take care of each other. How you doing with that, brother? How you doing with that, sis? You giving your life to your family? Because we're a part of God's family, and we are called to take care of one another. We're all adopted. If we've, if we've surrendered, we're all adopted. That's why we have groups. It's the whole point of groups. It's not so it take another night and you can just sit there and go through material and pray and eat and just leave. Gosh, no. I, I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this. I could care less. That's not true. Let me rewind. Holy Spirit, help me out here. years and not not listen to me don't don't hear me wrong god's word is the, is 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 life we we better hide in our heart we better memorize but my the point i'm trying to make is that if you are not connected to one another if you aren't excited about laying down your life to to serve one another to help one another then you are missing out on being part of the family on the benefits on the blessings some of you are waiting for the gifts from god and you are the gift from God. you got to connect. And when you start connecting, guess what? Then we're going to memorize. We're going to, me and Matt are going to memorize Psalm 1 all together. Then we're going to try to study Revelation. Underline that. Blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption. Underline that. Through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Here is where Jesus takes over. So listen to me. God chose you and now we see the son. Blessed in the beloved. That's Jesus. In other words, here's what this is saying. God the father accepts us as his children based on... accomplished it you with me so this is the second thing about you Jesus redeemed you you are redeemed by Jesus do you know this word redeem how many do I have any couponers in here and Mandy one time went through a season where like she did this whole scrapbook of coupon and trying to get groceries for free and you know those what are they called crazy couponers I don't know what's that extreme my, my apologies for all the extreme couponers in the building you could tell which ones they were over there, so. but redeem this this idea of redeem Jesus has redeemed you redemption means that you gain possession of something in exchange for payment uh, in this time when this was written slavery was was just common and, and so if I if I liked a, a certain slave and I wanted to set them free. Oh, this mic's on. Look at that. Hey, listen, if, if, I, if I liked a certain slave and, and Pastor Rod was a slave and I wanted to redeem Pastor Rod, I would purchase him. I would pay a buck fifty for him. Right? Now, nah, he's worth a lot more than that. But, but I, would, I would buy him. And so I would give that to Sarah, his master. True story. And, and so, and so, <laughs> so when I give Sarah the dollar fifty, Pastor Rod is now set free. I purchased him and set him free. I redeemed him. I redeemed him with the dollar fifty. This is what Jesus did for you. Can I be real with you for a second? And I've been real, but I, just let me say this. I think many people, many Christians, see salvation as only forgiveness. Let me explain it to you. You say, God, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. And he forgives you. 
Imagine, though, if that's all God did for you. If God only forgave you, you confess your sin, he forgives. Guess what has to happen again, like 20 minutes later when you get in the highway? You have to confess again, and he has to forgive you again. See, this is why people, people struggle with the Lord. See, this is why some of you think your relationship with God is hanging by a thread. Because you know what you did. That thing, you know, that nobody knows. Or the way you acted. The way you treat your parents. The pride that's inside of you as you see people or listen to things. The way you've not put God for, you know what you've d done. And so now your relationship is like, if I ask you, are you good with God? You're like, I don't know. I hope so. I'm trying. I'm doing okay. I I'm, I'm really praying more and I'm, we're coming to church and I I'm trying to read my Bible. And what happens is when you sin, man, there's like, you feel trapped. You, you feel like, gosh, I let God down again. God is so disappointed in me. And so every time you sin, you would have to repent again and ask forgiveness. Which means, listen, listen. That means that the only way you make it to heaven is if you ask God for forgiveness and then somehow before you die, you don't sin anymore. And that's the way you live your life. But listen to me. This verse just told you that Jesus redeemed you. Remember what redemption is? Jesus paid all of it. He paid for you in full. He didn't just pay for your pinky. He didn't just pay for that moment that you made a decision to trust him. He paid for the, he paid for the entirety of you. So he know he paid for the sin you did yesterday, the sins maybe you've thought in this moment and today, and he paid for the sin that you're going to commit next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like asking God for forgiveness every time we sin is not for God, it's for us. God, God has bought you. You are clean. And I get it. With that freedom, it sounds like it's a license to sin. I can just do what I want and I'm covered by the blood of the lamb. I'm just going to tell you as, as, as I'm feeling this and thinking this, that if that's your attitude, you better check your heart. There's no way you're walking with God and think that sin is okay. Jesus has redeemed you. He paid it all. He settled the score. So when you're close to God, he's redeemed you. And when you're far away from God, he's redeemed you. When you fail, you're still chosen. You're still loved. You're still adopted. He ain't kicking you out of the family. Verse 8 says he lavished this on us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. Which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, praise God. We obtained it, by the way. Some of you are waiting for the inheritance. You have obtained it. That's a past tense. Having been predestined. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Paul says God has had a good purpose for you. Look at verse 13, he says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. So listen, the moment you believed in Christ, trusted Christ, the moment that God, you understood that God chose you, that God redeemed you, in that moment, 
you were sealed, underline that word, with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, underline that phrase, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You are chosen by God. You are redeemed by Jesus, but you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are sealed. It's not like with a glue stick. and You can unseal it. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. He is the one who brings salvation into your heart. And he is the guarantee that what God started, he will finish. The Spirit has sealed you. He, listen. You are chosen, you are redeemed, and you are sealed. Some of you try to get saved every Sunday. It's crazy. And I don't mean to be ugly, but like when you, when you understand what I'm preaching right now, when you understand that, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for the worst of you, for the best of you, and for the future you, it's a one-time thing. There's, there's no kind of love like that ever. That you'll ever experience. Apart from Jesus. Here's how I'll say it. You, do, you don't get into God's family based on how good you are. So you can't get out of his family based on how bad you are. Go ahead. Let You did nothing to get into God's family. You were dead. And so on your worst days, when you just don't even look like a child of God, you need to remember that he has bought you. That he paid for that sin. He laid down his life for that. You're sealed. Paul goes on to say he's the guarantee of our inheritance in verse 14 until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee. It's a deposit. Anybody make deposits? Yeah. Like we, we had to make a deposit. Our, our students, by the way, students, your money's due today for casual. That we had to put down a deposit. You see how I did that? I just slid that right in. in. Our, stu our students had to pay a deposit in order to go to this uh, youth retreat that they're going to. I think it's next month. Maybe two months. Something like that. But they had to put a deposit down. What's a deposit? A deposit is a down payment. It's a guarantee that I'm good for the rest of it. So listen, listen. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee, the deposit of our inheritance. What, what does that mean? For glory, for future you, for transformation in you and through you, for eternal life. The Holy Spirit has sealed you and dwells in you and is a guarantee of what's to come. It's a deposit. It's signed, it's sealed, and it one day will be delivered. And then Paul prays this prayer and he says, this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, your love toward all the saints. I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of our glory. Now, here's what he prays over the church may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Here's the prayer. I'm praying that you would know God more. You want to pray for your brothers and sisters? Pray that they'll know God more. Because when they know God more, they'll respond better. When they know God more, that they'll prioritize better. When they know God more, that their marriage will be better. When you know God more, your, your circumstances will improve. That doesn't mean life gets easy and life won't come with trials. It just means now that you are resting in Jesus through those trials. And that's why it gets better. This has got to be our prayer. My prayer for you as a church and, and us as a people and us as a group and 
My prayer is that we know God more. To remember eternity. That we're not meant for this. I got to remember that we have a hope that I've, he's called me. That he's redeemed me. He's chosen me. He's sealed me. Why? Why is this so important to remember our inheritance? Because right now on earth, we have a tendency to look for the earthly blessings and the gifts. Rather than the one who blesses and gives. You know what I mean? It's like when you get married. Do I have any newlyweds in here? Any newlyweds? No rose. You're not newly read anymore. You've been married. Okay, I guess I'll use you guys. But when you first get married, when you first get married, right, you get all these wedding gifts. You remember, remember your wedding gifts? Do you, you guys remember your wedding gifts? Like, I don't know what you got. Maybe it was a mixer or a toaster or some towels or I don't know. I've seen some bougie registers. I mean, registries. This is crazy. But, but you get all these gifts, right? And, and then... Can you imagine now you got all these gifts and you're really excited about marriage. And you're really excited. You got all this new stuff. Can you imagine if I came to you, Brian, and I said, Brian, how's marriage? And you said, man, it's awesome. The toaster I got is pretty phenomenal. Let me tell you about it, man. Hey, and these towels, they feel so silky smooth on my body. I'm like, Brian, hold up, Brian. Okay. And man, I remember um, the gift that. Can you imagine Brian talking about the gifts more than Crystal, his wife? I wonder how many of us do that with God. We focus on what we don't have and what we're not getting and what everyone else has had and what they're getting. We're not even focused on the one. Who is our love. Too many people are interested in what God can give to them. And not God. Paul is saying, don't lose the focus. My prayer for you is to know him. Just to know him. To remember who you are and what you're called to. And he keeps going. He says, verse 19, we're almost done. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ. Don't miss this. When he raised him from the dead, he seated him at the right hand in, his, in the heavenly places, far above the rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Oh, Paul is saying, listen up. I don't want you to forget this. If you've been chosen, if you've been re redeemed and you've been sealed, then you've got power inside of you. And it's not just the power to get through a bad day. You've got resurrection power inside of you. The same power that rose a dead Jesus back to life to, to, to give us life. that power is inside of you. You can't miss that. You have access to that power. And if you're not seeing that power in and through you, then you've got to do some examination of why. See, this is how you change. It's not, I come to church more, I pray more, I do more, I get all, we're just becoming a, a rule follower. Church becomes about rule and it becomes boring and, and, how do we change? See, you don't have the power. You don't have the ability on your own to overpower anxiety. You can go to counseling. You can take some medicine. And those are good things. But you don't have the ability to overcome depression or worry or fear. You don't have the ability to be more self-controlled. You don't have the ability to stop blowing up in a tense situation. You don't have the ability to, to stop looking at the things that you look at nonstop. 
listening to the things, watching the things. You don't have the ability to take that lust out of your heart. You don't have the ability to stop being a big old flirt. You don't have ability. It is out of your control. You don't have the ability to stop using language. Or you don't have the ability to get off drugs. It's, it's not as easy as that. What do you have to do to change? You got to surrender to God. Surrender. How does this happen? Think about it. Well, no, okay, well, I'm not going to consider you a sailor. I'm just kidding. Okay, so, so you have a sailboat. Now, if the sail is down, check this now. Stay with me. Stay focused. I know there's movement. Stay focused. If the sail is down and the boat is in the water, the boat won't move. The sailboat won't move if the sail is down unless the waves are crashing and the water is moving. This is you. Some of you are living your life with your sail down. You are rocked. You are rocked financially. You are rocked relationally you are rocked emotionally you are rocked on social media you, you everything is tossing you here and there and everywhere and you feel like you are on the ride of your life and you hate it and you're a follower of Jesus but your sail is down so wherever the wind and waves and circumstances and government You're, in, you're incapable of moving. You're submitting to the waves. Now listen to me. Christian, we are incapable. We are incapable of being who God wants us to be on our own. Some of you are so tired trying and failing. You're incapable. You're incapable of quitting. You're incapable of thinking. You're incapable of, you're just, you can't do it because your sail's down. What is our responsibility to live this Christian life? And it's to open up the sail. It's to open up the sail. What does that look like practically? God, I'm going to date the way you tell me to date. I'm going to look at their heart. I'm going to move out because we're not married. And that's hard, God. I don't know how that'll work. And I'm scared, God. What if? What if? They break up with me. And that's where we get in trouble. Because we start playing the what if game. And in our what if game, we become disobedient. Open up the sail. And date the way God wants you to date. I'm going to prioritize the way you want me to prioritize, God. And I know that you are first. So before I ever start my day... I'm going to spend time with you, Dad, Father, Abba. I'm going to prioritize you. I'm going to prioritize your word. I'm going to pray for my family. I'm going to pray for my boss, who's a jerk. I'm going to pray for, for the people I have to come encounter with, God, because you've sealed me with the Holy Spirit. It's a guarantee that I'm supposed to call, go, and Holy Spirit starts moving and blowing you in a certain way. The breath of God. I'm going to take time for people. I'm going to join a group. And I'm so busy, God, I, don't, I, don't, I can't do another thing. But God, I know that you've called me to love you.
love people. And there's a lot about loving the church. So I need to get connected with some people in our church. And I don't know what I'm going to have to give up, God, but I need the Holy Spirit to lead me. The sail goes up. The breath of God blows over you. And you move. You find out there's a group that meets at a time that maybe works for you. And it's going to require doing some things a little differently, but all of a sudden now the Holy Spirit is leading. I'm going gonna, gonna to prioritize my finances. I'm poor because X, Y, and Z. But man, I could cut out a Starbucks drink and give God $5, give a person $5, get invested. I could give up my time. I can give, I can serve. I don't have to be a consumer in the church. I'm going to take time for God. And the sale just goes up. And the breath of God moves you and blows over you. And before you know it, you look back and you realize, hey, I love the duck. not more self-help sermons, counseling. It's not stop blowing up. But you lift your sail. You let the breath of God blow over you. Move you. How do you do this? One step at a time. Right now, what's God saying that you need to do? Just one thing. Everybody's got one thing. What's the next thing? If you don't know, what's the last thing that God told you to do? Keep doing it. Be faithful. Obedient. Hear me, church. You're chosen. Loved. you and you are sealed with a guarantee of inheritance by the Holy Spirit of God and I know you don't feel valuable and I know you see your insecurities but God sees you and loves you just as you are he's already proven it he don't have to prove it anymore and all he asks from us surrender so we're going to stand go ahead and stand I'm going to ask you to for 30 seconds breathe God in don't talk, don't move just for 30 seconds breathe God in these guys are going to start singing you do business with God do business. pray with people move, sit, raise your hand just do business with God what's the thing he's telling you it's the one thing. Father, thank you for choosing someone like me. Move. Save people. I pray that Christians start seeing themselves the way you see them. They'll only do that if they know your word and know who you are. Thank you for truth. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that to do that this morning. There's no special prayer that saves you. There's no, there's no special words or anything that, that's going to give you your, your, your ticket punched into heaven. It's just simply you believing that Christ died on the cross for your sins. It's you and your mind right now saying, God, I believe in your son Jesus and what he did on the cross for me. And if you don't know what to say, you can just repeat after me. It's very, very simple. Jesus, I believe that you are Lord and I believe that you died on the cross and rose again. I put my trust in you 
and I follow you as my Savior. That's it. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you met that, nobody's looking around or anything, I'd like for you to slip up your hand. Just very quickly, you slip up your hand, you can put it back down. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your son. We thank you for just being redeemed by your son, Jesus, Lord. We thank you that he paid the price for us so that we can be in a relationship with you in eternity. I pray that the Holy Spirit just moves over each and every person in this room. I pray that they understand that they are chosen by you for purpose. They're chosen by you uh, for, to do your will and to glorify you, Lord. I pray that they understand that they are chosen and that they are redeemed. Help us to live in that and help your spirit to continue to move in us. And we pray these things in your name. And everybody said, hey, listen, don't forget on the Vision app, if you guys have questions about the service, if you have questions about something that Pastor Chris said or anything like that, on the app, there's a tab called ATM. Don't be confused. We're not giving you money or anything like that. If you want to give us your debit card information, we'll take that though. Um, if you have questions, just make sure you guys check that out. You guys have been uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out and love Jesus, love people, and live your purpose. We'll see you guys next week.